welcome back to the Get Out of Your Comfort Zone interview series where we engage thought leaders about the challenges that they have had in stepping outside their comfort zones in their lives and work, and also advice that they have for young people interested in developing their leadership potential. Today we have a very special guest. Um, Kathleen Kelly Jenis is a social entrepreneur author and lecturer at Stanford University. As an expert on philanthropy, millennial engagement, and scaling early stage organizations, her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Huffington Post, Stanford Social Innovation Review, TechCrunch, and the San Francisco Chronicle. She's the co-founder of Spark, the largest network of millennial donors in the world. Based in the heart of the Silicon Valley, her brand new book, Social Startup Success, features best practices for early stage nonprofit organizations based on a five year research project interviewing hundreds of top performing social entrepreneurs. She can be found at www.kathleenjanis.com. And I am very happy to have you with us today, Kathleen. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, Andy. Great. So let's jump right in. So I want to start um, with the topic of comfort zones, because I imagine that's a key topic, given your focus, given your interests, given your career. And I'd love you to think of a time when you have had to step outside uh, your comfort zone. Uh, mm -hmm. What was that like? What were the challenges? How did you overcome them? Any advice you have? Yeah. Well, I will say that uh, when you are trained as a lawyer, as I am, you are not very good at stepping outside your comfort zone because I think uh, I can't imagine a more path driven career than going to law school, going to work at a law firm going to be on partner track. Um, and, and I, and I took that path because, um, it, it was very safe because I knew that I would always have a paycheck. I knew that I would always, um, be growing and developing and be exposed to interesting people. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to do social justice work. And so when I was at, the law firm, I spent my days billing hours and um, spent my nights co-founding this organization, Spark, um, which engages millennials in gender equality issues and philanthropy here in San Francisco. And, you know, for me, it was interesting because I did, in a way, have this safe platform to cling on to. I had a regular paycheck, um, which most entrepreneurs do not, <laughs> um, and, and was able to dip my toe in, so to speak, um, into that world before actually launching into doing it more full time. And so for me, you know, stepping outside my comfort zone was about how about kind of taking risks, but taking controlled risks that felt safe in, in my world. And I think we also, we have to recognize that being an entrepreneur is a luxury. I think everybody likes to glamorize this idea of living in a basement or starting something out of a garage or getting funded by, you know, a wealthy uncle, if you're lucky enough to have one. And the reality is one of the things that I've learned in all of my interviews for my new book, Social Startup Success, is that this isn't an option for a lot of people that what if you've lived in a basement your entire life that, that all of a sudden um, you don't have the same choices that some people have. Um, it's a privilege to be an entrepreneur. And um, I, I think we also need to recognize that we need to be more supportive of allowing people who don't have those privileges of having wealthy uncles or, you know, maybe who come from communities where they need to support their families and don't have the luxury of spending six months to test out an idea without a paycheck. How can we support those people to take risks as well? Because ultimately those might be the people who are in a better position to solve some of these really pressing social problems that we face today. 
I wish I had a wealthy uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> um, so this that's 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 interesting. I'd, I'd love to actually rewind for a second. Um, and you should definitely check out Kathleen's book, by the way. It's a really cool book. And I, I don't usually, I, I have to tell you quickly the backstory here. I, I got, I heard about her book um, and, and I don't usually invite people on here who, 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 um, who email me um, about, about their books, but this was just so compelling that I, I had to have you on. So that's, that's a, it's a rare uh, thing for me. So I'm really happy to have you here. I just want to rewind um, for a second, you're a lawyer, you're getting those paychecks that you're talking about, you're billing those hours, you're on the safe path, you're growing and learning, you said, though, too, it wasn't just pure monotony, there was some mm -hmm. interest in there as well. Um, what, how did you start sort of your side hustle, <laughs> kind of like your side gig there? Like, did you just sort of like say, I'm going to do this. And just one night you started typing into a computer. Did you have a, a, a friend you worked on with it? Did you like mm -hmm. literally like, can you bring us back into the moment where you weren't doing it to where you were doing it? Like, like into the, like the, that, that, what was that like? What did you do? Yeah. So I became really, um, interested in this idea of engaging millennials for two reasons. One is because I had just come out of law school, was constantly exposed to really interesting talks and speakers. And, you know, I wanted to continue that in my law firm life and in my new life in San Francisco and, and wasn't able to find an audience where I felt like you know, that I could, I could, I could find that kind of intellectual stimulation. And so I wanted to bring my peers together to engage them. Also felt like organizations weren't really valuing the contributions that young people were making. And, um, and that, you know, we would stretch ourselves to give $250. And then, you know, an organization would obviously take the money. But, um, you know, what felt like so much money to us was just kind of a drop in the bucket and, you know, never really paid attention to us again. And so that didn't feel very good. And so we thought, okay, well, what if we bring our resources together collectively? And how can we prove to organizations that millennials have not just, you know, money to give, although we can collectively make a big impact, um, but also time and resources and, and other resources and networks and connections. And so I give you all this background because I was solving for a real problem. And I think that's really important um, because I think a lot I hear, I see this at Stanford a lot, you know, students will come to me and say, I have this great idea for, you know, helping people in South Africa and, um, you know, and then they'll say, okay, I, I'll say, have you been to South Africa? And they'll say, no, but, but I, I, you know, I could go there, <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'll probably start, you know, learning. And, and the biggest advice I always give to my students is go learn from someone else um, before you, before you try and start something yourself. So at the time we were solving for a real problem and um, and so we tested ideas and I think this is a big, this is a big piece of social startup success of my book is that it's not about like just going out and launching a big organization It's starting with a project. We started with one event and that one event had a line around the block and had people who wanted to do more. And so we immediately started charging membership fees to, to people so that we could provide more services so that we could provide talks so that we could, um, bring people together for giving circles. And, um, and so it became this very natural and organic thing, responding to people's needs, as opposed to us going out there and saying, okay, we have this idea and we're going to, we're going to solve this problem. Um, and I think that's what I've seen over and over again in the best social entrepreneurs is that the best social entrepreneurs fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Yeah. And so, so long as you are really being a good listener and paying attention and creating purposeful feedback loops so that you're learning what's helping um, and what's not, um, that's when you're going to be most effective in the work that you're doing. So did when you first started, the, you mentioned we, by the way, a few times. Yeah. Who, who's, who's the we? I was working with six other co-founders. Okay. So it was a group mm -hmm. of you. Group of women that came out of UC Berkeley. Interesting. Okay. Did you, did you, um, you know, gosh, when you talked about your first event, I think to myself, it's almost like 
you know, sometimes throwing a party and wondering if anyone's going to come. Did you, I mean, were you, were you guys afraid or worried or concerned or trepidatious that anyone would be interested in this? Like, was it? Of course, did, yeah. of course. And I mean, beyond that, it was a cocktail party to talk about genocide. I mean, talk about like... <laughs> Mood killer. <laughs> yes, yes, bringing together, yes, a strange, strange bedfellows. Um, and, you know, and so I think it was, it was risky. It was taking a risk to, to, to put ourselves out there and to say, okay, we, we do believe in our peers and we believe that if you create an opportunity for people to learn about things like the Rwandan genocide, um, that they will want to learn more and want to do something about it and want to get involved and 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 it worked so 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 i and i can see that it's such an important cause that you know yes it's not like um i don't know it's 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 a real serious intellectual question and problem and something that people can really care about and so i see why that motivated you um let me move on to the second question which which really follows right up from what we're talking about because you're you know you're young you graduated from law school you've got six or five or six friends that you want to start something with you're you know there's a gap you were a bit dissatisfied you want to create something new and powerful um i think a lot of young people have that ambition you know and i know you come into contact with them in your work at stanford mm -hmm. as, a, as a professor i do too um so a, a lot of young people are interested in developing their leadership potential, you know, becoming a leader, really doing something impactful. Some people walk into it with no problem, no qualms. Other people say, leader, you know, who am I to like, you know, that's presumptuous for me to think that I could possibly do anything. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not a leader. I've never done anything. Um, what would you say to that sort of more, you know, I don't know, humble, modest, trepidatious, concerned, uh, anxious person who does have some ideas, does have some ambition, but is kind of scared to put themselves out there and develop a leader potential or even start to become a leader. What might you say to that person? Well, a couple things is one, I think systems, um, uh, systems that prevent everybody from being their best leader are broken systems. In, in my book, I, I highlight this idea of collective leadership, that everyone within organizations has something to offer. And so the onus is on the company or the organization or the firm to really empower um, it's, it's employees to be able to come up with ideas and to, um, and, and to bring those ideas to the table and, and be validated for them. Um, so that would be my first, my first point, but as, as you, you don't always get to choose the kind of the structures that you're working in. And so my advice would be to, to really, to really focus on, um, developing expertise and learning and, and becoming not necessarily um, the best person at something, but sometimes it's, sometimes it's best to be the only person <laughs> who knows what you're doing. I mean, by becoming, by becoming, by bringing knowledge to the table that others in your company or your firm don't have, automatically you're going to be providing a service and a value that um, they can't deny. And so, um, really focusing on both bringing together an area where you can add value, but then also an area where you're passionate. And once you marry those two, then um, I think it's when people can be really effective in bringing their leadership to the table. That's that's really helpful. I imagine that's helpful to a lot of people listening. Can can you give an example of 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 a, a young person, you know, becoming the only person, or at least developing <laughs> some sort of distinctive, unique expertise? I mean, what would be an example of that? Um, well, I can think about one of my students. I mean, I, I think so many, so many of my students work um, on projects for for um, my class, and I often have our fellows who come in and say, "Okay, I want my I want your students to write a fundraising plan for me." And I say, "You know, okay, I love my students; they do amazing work, but they don't have expertise in fundraising." And so, you know, I try and 
harness my students' energy where um, where they can be effective. And, you know, one area where young people have a huge advantage um, is in understanding social media, being digital native natives and, and, and knowing kind of how to use technology to enhance systems, to enhance marketing, to enhance um, visibility for a company or an organization. And, um, and so... Um, you know, a great example is um, for my book, I, I worked with one of my students who happened to tell me once that she loved podcasts. And I said, oh, that's great. Tell me tell me more about what podcasts you're listening to. And she told she gave me a little list and then we left it at that. When it came to my, um, my book coming out and I, I wanted to get on podcasts, I, I, I approached her and I said, I will give you uh, $20 an hour to pitch as many as podcasts as you can. Um, and you you go out there and you find what podcasts might be interested in hearing about social startup success. And um, I'll go on any podcast that you can get me on. And she and she did it and she hustled and she it's been an enormous success. I, I, my, my epic podcast tour is now <laughs> 30 podcasts strong. Right. Um, and, you know, I think that's a great example of, of, of someone who, you know, she's 21. No, she's not even 21. She's 20. Um, she's provided an enormous value to, to my, um, my book launch. And it's because she's been able to harness something that she's passionate about and that she knows more about than I do um, in a way to, um, to, help, to help provide value to my project. That's cool. I think she probably pitched me. <laughs> she, yeah. was she was good. So, so this is interesting. Like, like, um, I, I think it's a great tip. Um, I imagine though, it's also an interesting question for a young person. Let's say you are a digital native. I mean, most people of that age are digital native, certainly compared to me. Um, and you you recognize that you could add this value. You recognize, for example, that your mar that your company's marketing is a bit stodgy, or they're not really speaking in an authentic way to the ultimate consumer, or they're using you know the, kind of the, the 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 platforms of five years ago instead of today and tomorrow, and so on and so forth. How do you? I guess a question that I would have is 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 how do you um how do you advocate for that? You know, you mm -hmm. talked about you talked about the the, the top down method that firms need to be better at empowering uh, employees and basically ultimately really using all their resources in a, in a positive yeah. way. But how about the bottom up approach? Like, do you yeah. do you go in? Do you walk? You know, obviously you don't do this, but you walk into your boss's office and say, "Dude, I know how to fix your social media." <laughs> you know, like yeah. like what yeah. do you what do you like? How do you how do you approach it? You know, in a way that's not you know too much and not too little. Yeah. Well, I would say two things that really work is one, economic arguments, because um, every company likes to know how they're going to make more money or save money. Yeah. And um, and two, competition. What's the competition doing? And, and, and because every company needs to keep up with the competition. So I think a really good example, and one of the reasons why I wrote Social Startup Success is because I truly believe that we are living in this renaissance of social change where everybody can be involved in making a difference in their community in one way or another that we're not necessarily relegated to, you know, doing good after we leave the office at 5 p.m., that you can make it a part of what you do at work even, whether it's giving back skills or um, donations or getting your um, colleagues involved in causes. And companies have no choice but to do this because um, millennials are now asking when they are in the interview process, what is the social cause that your company cares about? And it's it defines whether they will even accept the job in the first place. And the evidence shows that uh, employees who are more involved in social causes will be more loyal and will stay with a firm um, longer, which avoids really expensive turnover that can cost a company hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if I were a, a young person, for example, and I wanted my company to get more involved in social causes, I would take this evidence to the HR department and I'd, 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 I'd find other companies that were um, in my peer com company's peer group and see what they're doing and give them some examples. And I think the key is to come with a solution, not with a problem. So don't just say, you know, here's the problem we need, 
social causes in our firm and what are you going to do about it? But here are the five ways that you, we can develop a social cause pro- program. And here's why I think it'll be effective. Great. Fantastic advice. I imagine that's something that people listening right now will, you know, be able to, you know, go off and use. So, so thanks yeah. so much. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Um, Social Startup Success is the book. It's a, it's a really cool book. I would really strongly recommend you checking it out. Her website again is www.kathleenjanis.com. And thanks so much for being on uh, today. Thanks, Andy.